deal is it releasing GTA 5 for these so-called next-gen platforms? Well, it's a really big deal, and not just for us, but for all of the gamers who love the title and love the brand. Uh, we're really excited. We have our first reviews out on PS4. The Metacritic rating is 97. 97 is the highest in the generation. And uh, there's only one review for Xbox One, which is uh, 95. And we'll take that. <laughs> what have your reviews been before for earlier generations? You know, uh, very high, in the high 90s. So this, but for this, the reviewers have been tough on next-gen games. So this is a very high score for next-gen games. People need to be careful, though, about getting ahead of themselves on the sales expectations because there are, what, 160 million PlayStation 3s and Xbox 360s out there and only about 10% as many next-gen platforms. Right, and growing rapidly, we hope, through the holiday season. It certainly feels like the curve is going to be very steep, and we think Grand Theft Auto V for next-gen is a must-have title. Does that explain why you are releasing the titles the way that you do? In other words, because there was such a massive installed base? Go for the installed base first and then catch up with the next-gen console. Yeah, I, and I think, uh, you know, we don't manage everything perfectly, but I think we did manage this transition rather well. You know, when the, the consoles were first launched, we put out NBA. That was our first next-gen title, which to this day is still the highest-rated uh, next-gen sports title. And then this season, now a year later, with the beginning of a robust installed base, we had a very big release schedule in October. Uh, and now, of course, capped off today with... Uh, WWE 2K15 for next gen, and of course Grand Theft Auto 5 for next gen. How much does it cost you to produce this game, Grand Theft Auto? A lot. Just to put it in perspective. Yeah, we don't actually talk about those numbers, but we do say in our filings tens of millions of dollars. And these days, what we do looks a lot like, and from a cost point of view, luckily not from a volatility or a revenue point of view, but from a cost point of view, it looks a lot like the motion picture business. We spent a lot of money to make one of these titles. Um, they are immersive, you can play them for a very long time, and then we market them all around the world in a high-class way. Okay. It's a, big, if, it's a big risk. If we're going to draw... Said high, he just said high-class, so you've opened the door. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. We've got to talk about what's in Grand Theft Auto. Players have the right to have sex with a prostitute and then kill her. Is this true? Well, <laughs> I don't look at it that way at all. Look, this is a criminal setting. It's a gritty underworld. It is art, and I and I I embrace that art, and it's beautiful art. But it is gritty, and let's not make you know, let's not make no bones about the environment in which we operate. And we stand shoulder to shoulder with other major motion picture releases and major television shows that explore a similar universe. So yeah, yeah, this is a tough universe because it's a criminal universe. However, there's hundreds of hours of gameplay. People have been engaged with Grand Theft Auto Online for over a year, and there are plenty of things to do. And it's an incredibly exciting environment. And it's but, not. But like, can it be? Can it be rough? Absolutely. It's not like GTA V was clean without the hook. I'm not. Cr I'm not criticizing. I'm just asking. You're just commenting. Yes. Um, Strauss, let's rewind the clock maybe 18 months, right? Before the release of GTA V, we were talking about the threat that mobile gaming and social gaming posed to the traditional suppliers of console games like yourselves, for example, or uh, Activision, or Electronic Arts, for example. I put together a chart that I think is fairly illustrative because people still have that idea. If I can go to the iTunes store and get a game for 99 cents, why would I want to go out and buy myself an Xbox One? Why would I want to buy a PlayStation 4? Why would I want to drop 60 bills on GTA 5? So this is your stock price since you took over as CEO. And here's what happened when Zynga came along. Zynga did great out of the box and then not so great. And King Digital has had a bit of a, a rough ride since it, since it went public in March. What does that say to you? Does, is that the story of social and mobile gaming? Or do you see promise in social and mobile gaming, maybe just not in those companies? I do see promise in it. And it's one of the reasons that it actually forms a part of what we do, although our view is that uh, you know, we, we don't look at social or mobile. We, we look at screen size and processing power, small, medium, large size screens, light, mid-core and heavy processing power. And there's no question that our DNA is big screens, robust engagement, high processing power. And the, you know, the Zingas of the world typically have focused on very small screens and light processing power. What does that I, mean? Just what does high processing power mean? In other words, the ability really to engage in, with characters who look very, very real. If you play one of our sports games and 
move you know a few feet back from the screen it looks like a basketball game it's extraordinary today so and that's real, that's processing power that, that drives that um, there are different experiences there is a role in the market for both uh, what I said when we spoke 18 months ago is when asked about cannibalization look these are different markets there's plenty of room for everyone I think the issue that some companies have faced is if you want to succeed in the entertainment business whether it's uh, smartphone games console games television shows um, internet programming or motion pictures you must focus first and foremost on quality you've got to deliver a great experience and I think the time to be nervous about a company is when they talk first and foremost about data or transferring an audience or customer engagement um, the kind of the kind of conversations some of these social gaming companies but do you have. have to deliver that great experience when I'm standing in line in a store and there are people next to me all playing Candy Crush on their phones it's not a great experience but that they're doing it it is a great experience for what it is it's not a it's not a basketball game it's not a hundred hour uh, console game. Candy Crush is a great game for what it is. The tough thing in mobile is for every Candy Crush there are thousands of failures. The hit ratio in the social space is very low wow. and that's why your chart looks the way it does Eric. It's not that uh, smartphone games are by themselves bad. They can appeal for exactly the time you said Stephanie. You're standing in line at the supermarket. You're not at home engaging for hours in a basketball game. Uh, and it can be great. But it appears that it's harder to make that great. But why wouldn't you? Why would you not want to have both markets? Seeing that it costs you tens of millions of dollars to create a Grand Theft Auto and market it around the world, why not go both directions? And we are. And where we are, we found that we can have success is when we make companion games that use different screen sizes and su support another one of our titles. For example, WWE Supercard is a smartphone game that's doing fantastically well. I will say, when we've tried to do standalone smartphone games, our hit ratio hasn't been any better than anyone else's. So we like to do games that really leverage our intellectual property and delight consumers even more when they're engaged. You know, Candy Crush is a, is a big title. Angry Birds has been a big title. There aren't a lot of big titles in that space. We don't like, we don't like that math. Strauss, where does um, virtual reality fit into the future of Grand Theft Auto and take two more broadly? It's, it's early still to say. Now, I've finally had a demonstration of some of the technology. And I, Oculus? Uh, it, was, it was actually the Morpheus uh, headset, uh -huh. and, I, and it was a roller coaster ride. I love roller coaster rides, by the way. It was really real. It did, was phenomenal. Did it make you barf? No, I don't throw it. <laughs> I had to ask. But if, did it but if make one, you bark? But if one, if one <laughs> were to. Look, that's that, the rub on Oculus up until recently. I think was that rub, if you wore, like, it, it, it was such an extrasensory experience, a lot of people couldn't help but vomit. And, and actually, I mean, there are plenty of issues about using an immersive headset for the kind of uh, video games that we make because among other things like how are you going to see your controller how does a controller interact with this immersive space what does it turn but, you into as a member of society like if it's an issue that we're standing there with our faces in our phones what does it do to humankind that we're walking around looking like this you understand that this is I'm serious this is the question my great-grandparents raised about jazz music this is the question mark that my grandparents raised about rock and roll music and this is the question that you know my parents raised about hip-hop music this is the culture morphs and we all have to embrace this the exciting new opportunities in culture and you know what our culture can withstand edgy programming so is gaming ready for VR not yet uh, uh, yeah. part, part of it is we have to see how the headsets roll out and how we can best deliver an experience. And you're right, Eric, we are concerned that, you know, you play our games for a long period of time, we don't want people getting nauseated. No. And, and also, I'm, I mean, having had the experience, I'm not sure how long you want an immersive headset on your, on your head. We'll find out. You know, I will say this, if that's what consumers want, we'll be first in line to give how it to them. How about enhanced reality? That's kind of halfway between, right? Where they're taking different planes of focus. Yeah, and playing, I've, done, I've had that demo that. too. I, it's very tough from my point of view, but we'll see. You know, the, the demo that I have was at um, Microsoft's headquarters in a, in a room given over to this, and you you had again you had an immersive headset on, and there are characters that appear to be real, and you're interacting with the characters, and they're not real, and it's pretty extraordinary. I'm, I, I think it remains to be seen how we can, you know, commercialize that and bring a great experience to consumers. But you guys aren't going to be the first out of the gate. 
Uh, we we, uh, we show, <laughs> see no reason to innovate in terms of business models. We prefer to be a fast follower. You know, we, no one else can make our intellectual property. Only we can. So I'm happy to have other people spend loads of dough in R&D. <laughs> you know, we focus on being very efficient. We don't like spending money on science projects. We like to spend money on entertainment experiences.